This morning, Jim Burt is going to be our demonstrator. He's going to be talking about how to make these lovely patterns with that table saw. And he even figured out a way to create a table saw with a lathe. So, our resident genius, I'll turn it over to Jim. Just to let you know what's going on underneath here, if we can, I'll show you this one photograph. We can get. Just plug in one hand and. Underneath this box, there are two dowels with a steel pin connecting them. And around that steel pin, I have the blade. And then I have a box around that. Okay? Touch the screen. The reason I've done this is I can speak. Oh. I can talk louder than this thing runs. My table saw at home, it's, it screams so loud we'd all leave the room. Okay? So that's why I've done it this way. And it turns out it scared the heck out of me. And now I'm accustomed to it so it doesn't scare me anymore. So if anybody ever calls me a genius again, you know the truth, don't you? <laughs> okay, that's it. That's why. So the, the whole reason behind this is so I can talk over it. It's not going to be so loud that you guys have to wear a hearing protection. Okay. So first off, why bother? with table saw stuff for wood turners. And if you look over at the tables over there, you'll see why. Every month there's some really, really cool stuff brought in here. And it's done, starts off on the table saw. Okay. And uh, you might get the impression that all of this is just one series of really accurate, really precise cuts over and over again. And that's pretty much true. But if you do it right, you don't have to stress over it. You set your jigs up, correctly, you manipulate those digs correctly, and you get the accuracy and the precision you need. So it may look incredibly difficult, but it's not that hard. I can do it on a homemade machine, which I hope to show you today. Okay? Just to give you an idea, these are the, I make these plates, and they started off, there we go. I make these kind of plates and they started off being very, very difficult to make. But now that I know how to set that angle at 36 degrees, that turns out to be the only accurate cut in this whole plate. Maybe hard to believe, but there's only one accurate cut on this whole plate. Same thing with this bowl. There's only one accurate cut on this bowl and it's at 36 degree angle. Everything else I have a little bit of slot with. I can accommodate that. So it looks like this whole thing is made just, you gotta be crazy precise, crazy accurate, and that's not true. You have to do one cut really, really well. Okay. And there's some tricks I've learned that it looks like, is that terrible? Yeah. It looks like this rain goes all the way through. That is the ring and the star of one piece. And that's not true. It's made up of a disc on the bottom that contains the star. That ring comes from an embedded ring. So there's not a whole lot of accuracy involved in that. This is what I want to oh, one more thing. This book contains a lot of cool ideas. This is a different technique than what I'm going to use, but if you take the jigs that I'm using here, modify the concept, then you can do what's in this book fairly accurately. Actually, very accurately. A lot of good information in here. This is in the library, by the way. So today, I'm going to build this, and it's a, it's a simpler version of the five-point star. This I can do in an hour and a half. Okay, with that, I have... Maybe I can and maybe I can't. So here we have six diamonds that form a central star. And around that we have six more identical diamonds that form a border. 
and then I have these rays coming out of here. Okay. And if I wanted to draw a circle around that, I would just add this ring. So here's the idea. I need to build this six point star. And as a wood turner, I need to build a border out here so I have I have room to turn. So this would be the first thing I have to build. If I wanted to put a circle around that star, I would take uh, it's a cedar star, so I'd take a cedar border, put it down, and then as I turn through this, I form a circle. And it looks like that circle is part of this, but it's really not. Then I add two rings. Just let, let me get set so I don't have to mess with this. So it's pretty. Got it? There you go. Okay. I add two rings. And that's all I have to do. And I can glue this up and then I can turn this bolt. Okay. It looks like there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to be done, but if I take one step at a time, it's pretty simple. Uh, some of these things are so small that it looks like you can't make it in one piece, like this star that's embedded in there. I can make that this big around so I can hold it with clamps and then just turn it down to the size I need. Can you speak up a little bit? Okay, I'll try. I can Not better? Let me turn the volume up. Okay. We'll turn, the, we'll turn the knob up a little bit. So, the first thing I need to do is get my wood ready. And I actually spend more time preparing the wood than I do cutting these out. It is absolutely critical when I do these. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Believe it or not, I used to lecture in a 500 room, 500 seat auditorium, no microphone. Chalk dust all over the place, and now you can't hear me 10 feet away. <laughs> I spend more time preparing the wood than I do actually cutting the pieces out. Because I want these edges straight, and I don't mean kind of sort of straight. I want to hold a straight edge that I trust up against here, hold it up to the light, and I want to see very little light coming through here. Another thing that I often have to do is make sure that these sides are parallel. So I'll measure, that's 2.578, 2.579, Good enough. I, I don't worry about cutting wood closer than that because the humidity changes. Or if I just let it sit for a couple hours, those will change. That's what I start with. And in order to do that, I keep a sharp blade. And my final cut is always a lot more. First time I did this, good lord, you gotta get out of your mind. <laughs> and it's possible I really have it. There you go. Running at 2300 RPM. I'm going to take a light cut and I'm going to go slow so that that 62 blade has time to cut. sand my surfaces every now and then I'll take a block of wood and just give it just just a little bit of a sanding but most of the time I don't I want it to come off the table saw clean enough to glue okay so first thing I have to do in order to get these straight and true is to have a really sharp blade and each time I reach under here to adjust the blade I've cut myself so it's sharp the next thing I have to do is make sure that if I have a seriously crooked piece of wood, there's 
all kinds of jigs you can find on the internet. And I typically work with small pieces of wood. I built a sled. I have a, a runner underneath that rides in this slot. And it's not that tight. I have sandpaper on here, which just keeps the wood from sliding down. And I'll put a crooked piece of wood on here so that if this is low, I make sure I have I make sure I have wood hanging off the edge, and then I'll just run this through. And that'll straighten one edge of the board, then I get rid of this jig, flip the board around, run it through, and now I have them straight and parallel. Critical that I get that true. Uh, let's see. First thing I need to do when I make this is after I've prepared my wood, I typically cut these bands first, just because I have a wide piece of wood and I want to cut that band first. I've got two ways of doing that. I do not like putting the table saw up close and cut it here. I much prefer to have the band on this side. Too many times I've had them flip up, I've had them get wedged in here. There's too many bad things have happened. So I just gave up on that. banding. I want to just make just a real small shaving cut. I read out to say you should use a push stick every time you do this. Somebody should tell me that because I forget. But I'm getting to the point where I like this more and more. It keeps my hand away from the blade. It feels better than me turning my wrist this way and pushing, especially if I cut all day. Uh, when I start by making that edge straight, I do the same thing over here. trying to get these bands. And I want to cut a series of bands that are all the same thickness. I can make a jig like this, a depth stop, and I can set the distance from this side of the blade to this end of the depth stop, and it just keep moving. Every time I make a cut, I move this, the table, the, the fence over a little bit, and it works fine. All this is is a piece of wood that I've cut a kerf. Can y'all see that? Let's do that. There we go. There's a small kerf cut through here so this piece of wood can expand. I drill a hole and put a screw in there and as I tighten that screw it expands the wood and I can get it to fit to whatever uh, tightness I want but it won't wobble around. As that gets worn out, I just tighten the screw a little bit until I have that screw run all the way in there. And then as soon as I hit that bell, it'll still tighten up. So this thing will last a long time. Okay. And I just put a, a bolt to countersink a bolt, glue it in place, wing nut and a washer on top. This guy, I just cut a slot with a table saw and I'm ready to go. This is pretty simple. One of the problems with that is I have to keep moving the saw. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to keep moving the, the blade. 
I have to keep moving the fence, and I get tired of that after a while. So what I'm going to do with this jig is set my fence. <laughs> Now I don't have to move anything. the same thickness as I'm ever going to get with the salt. I can run these through a uh, drum sander, clean them up a little bit. Typically what I do, make sure I have a sharp blade and I use them just like they are quite often. So that gets me these bandings here. Okay. Next thing I need to do is cut the diamonds. All of these jigs you can find somewhere along the way online. The same way we look on online for uh, wood turning demos, exactly the same thing applies to table saw stuff. There's tons and tons of stuff out there. And uh, the modifications to these kind of jigs, different ways of doing it, but there's a lot of information out there. So if I'm not clear about what's going on, you can always ask me or go online a lot of information up there. Jim, okay. are you trying to tell us we don't have to invent everything every time? That's right. Somebody else has already made it. So, someone has already done it. You may, <coughs> you may have to look quite a while to find it. Did Jim, do you have the plans for the saw? No, I didn't. I didn't exactly plan it. I just built it and it worked. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Are you going to put that online? Uh, you know, I, oh, I have to apologize because I did not write this up. I haven't had, I only recently got this worked out, so I'm going to get this written up and then I'll get it to somebody so they can put it online. Uh, pictures and diagrams of the jigs and stuff like this. I'm still not sure this is a good idea. <laughs> I've used it and I haven't been hurt, but I want to spend more time on it before I suggest anybody does it. Just, I need to be careful about that. Okay, any questions about the banding? I need four pieces of banding, the same thickness, so that I can form the bands on here. Okay, next thing I need to do, and if I had time, I'd cut bandings to make this, but I just made it at home. You just you cut the bandings the same way. You need it a little bit thicker. You glue it, a dozen of them up in a ring, and there you have it. So this is banding material. Jim, how do you glue up that really thin ring that you just showed us? 
Uh, I take this segment, glue these two together, and then tape across here, and I pull the tape kind of tight, and then I just work my way all the way around, and I close that gap on the last one with tape. Then I flip it over, and then I want to pull these three pieces together. I'll put a piece of tape over here, and I pull, lay that tape down. So I start by taping individual segments together over here, and the last segment I pull it all together. Then I flip it over, and quite often it curls. Then I put a piece of I put a piece of tape across three of them and pull it tight, and that tightens these two joints. Then I come over and I do it here. I work my way around, and that tends to flatten it out somewhat, and then I'll lay it. I'll lay, put a piece of tape, or a roll of tape or something on there, and then put something heavy, hold it flat, and give it 15 minutes, and it's, I can pull the tape off and let it sit for a while. I don't want to use it after 15 minutes, but I can and typically, because this is so thin and I never, always have tear out, and these are always a little bit off, I run it through a sander, drum sander. Okay, I was going to ask how you flatten that face. Or I use double sided tape, stick it to the lathe, I'll put sandpaper on a board and hold it up there, and then peel it off. And I glue this, I'll glue this part to here, spin it, flatten it. Okay. So I use tape both sides and then weight it down to get it flat. Are there any questions about cutting the banding or getting these? Is that a 10 inch blade? Yes, sir. 10 inch, 60 tooth. 60 tooth. It used to be an alternate top bevel. Where the top of the teeth were canted, and then the face of the teeth were, and it would cut one side to the other. I'm too lazy to change my sharpening jig, so I just set it at zero. So the tops of the blades are still canted like this, but I've cut every face flat. That way I can sharpen it quickly. I would rather sharpen it quickly with a bad geometry than to sharpen it every now and then with a good geometry. So I decided to just put all these at zero. Okay, the next thing I need to do is cut six diamonds. these diamonds, I need these faces to be parallel, these faces to be, these edges to be parallel. That's got to be 60 degrees, not kind of sort of 60, but very close to 60. That's got to be 60. And that, if you do the math, which we're not going to, these are going to be 120 degrees. Okay. Now, the way I figured out how to do this is I want these two distances to be the same. And the simplest way I know to do that is to set my fence and cut this piece and that will give me this distance. Now I want to build a jig to hold this at 60 degree angle. And when I run this through, I don't move the fence. That guarantees This distance, which is what I cut when I ran my board through here, is going to be the same as this distance. Uh, this is kind of deceptive. I need to clear the decks here. Uh, 
that may make more sense. So I run my board through like this. That sets this dimension. Now I turn my board like this and put it on my jig. If this jig is set at 60 degrees and I run this through, I know that this dimension is the same as this dimension. I don't have to measure anything. All I have to do is get this angle right. I have to leave the table saw fence where I set it. If I don't move that, I'm guaranteed that these two dimensions are the same, as close as I'm ever going to get it with this table saw. Okay. Is that clear what I'm going to do? No. Let me get this jump out of the way. And now, how hard is it to make this fence? Let's just make one real quick. I'll show you. It seems like this stuff is just one, uh, one long, difficult process after another with highly accurate cuts, and that's simply not true. For this one, I need to buy a 30, 60, 90 drafting triangle. I put it up against here. I put this arm here. That's very close to 60 degrees. It's amazing that these things are that accurate. Okay, so let's do it. So the game plan is pretty straightforward. I'm going to elevate my triangle so I don't glue it to the table. I have a microphone on and I ain't talking about that with a microphone on. Okay. And the, I've, I've trimmed this at about 60 degrees, but you can cut that by hand. It doesn't have to be accurate because I'm not going to let this part of the arm touch the fence. I want it pulled back just a hair. Okay. I'm going to mark where I want the super glue. This is super glue. I got, I think I got it at the dollar store there in Knox City. Okay. You have the street address? Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> the street address in the dollar store? Yeah, in Knox City. We need the address. <laughs> Go to Knox City, head toward Monday. You can't miss it. It's on the left. <laughs> It's the only new building you'll find out there. <laughs> okay, if I lay down super glue. I have my base and the triangle and the arm. And there we go. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Whew, this stuff stinks. Okay, while that's setting up, by the way, Jim, on your fence, you move that around and then you tighten it. Do you check that with the left with a square on occasion, or, or is your fence just over and over accurate? Uh, this is how I check it. don't have a way to adjust it so I had to cut I had to make certain cuts the best I could at 90 degrees yeah. and then I take this whole platform and rotate it so that this zero clearance curve in here doesn't make noise if you were in here when I was setting it up you'd hear it scream and I just rotate the whole thing until it quit screaming that got me close and then I check it and it's close enough for what I'm doing um, it has to be close enough because there's nothing I can do about it except we'll take the whole thing. Okay. Now, to let you know about while well, this is setting up, uh, I cut this base, and I think it's about 8 inches by 8 inches, and I want this face to be straight because that's, that's part of my measurement. That has to be straight. And I want this side parallel, and I'll check that. 
That way, if something happens over here, I can rotate this around, move the fence, and trim it. Okay, and get this pretty close to true. Okay, the other thing I do, let's see if I can. Uh, here's just bare MDF. And here I've just drizzled a little bit of super glue on there, thin super glue, and then wiped it off with a, a shop towel. That's why it has that bluish kind of color to it. All I want to do is toughen that surface up. I'm going to do the same thing here. This is thin, fast setting super glue. I'm not trying to get a uniform coat or anything like that. I just want to toughen that surface. And then I'm going to put a little bit along that edge so it can seep underneath. And I want to make sure that I do not have buildup along this edge. I want that to be a good clean edge. I'm going to do the back side. Now I'm pretty sure this jig is going to last long enough. Okay. So there's my 60 degree angle. Now, let's see if it's going to work. Let me clear the decks. So the next thing I need to do is cut my wood. Set the fence at about one inch. Check the backside, there's always a little bit of fuzz 
and that's going to mess up my angle. I'm going to clean that fuzz off of there real gently. Clean it off of here. Just to be safe. I'm going to camper that edge a little bit so if I forget, the fuzz can lay down in there and it's not going to kick me out. But I have space. You can't see it there, but I have a little gap between my arm and the table saw fence for fuzz to go in there, just in case I forget. Okay. Now, I slide my workpiece up against the fence. I stick my finger in here and I think, not a chance. I've got to do something <coughs> so I can hold this piece from just flopping around. So, this is the clamp from one of those spring clamps. You've used these. Have you ever had one of them break while you're using it and go flying across the room? Hold it down so you can see it in here. Oh, yeah. One of these. I really enjoy using these. They're quick, cheap, easy, but they break. And I keep the spring so I can make things of this nature. There's no way I'm going to stick my finger in there. By the way, I cut myself reaching underneath here to adjust bolts. <laughs> I bumped that table saw and cut myself. So, here's what I've come up with. I'm going to use that spring clamp like a clothespin. Stay right. About to super glue. When I have time, I use Tight Bond 2. I do not trust super glue unless I have to. And I don't have time for wood glue, so I have to go at it this way. Okay. This is just a piece of scrap. Glued another piece of scrap on there, and the, the length of this determines the pressure, the downward pressure on this. So here's the procedure. I'm going to hold the base up against the fence. I have to make sure there's no fuzz or chips or anything in there. I'm going to use my fancy clothespin to hold that down. Here we go. Jig set up properly. The rest of this is just discipline. I'll do it the same way every time. I go slow so the blade has plenty of time to cut. So I get a clean cut. Knock all the fuzz off my workpiece.
mistake I made on this. I have about three quarter inch tall work piece and a half inch tall fence. I normally want that this, this arm taller than this so I don't tear out the back side. Two, four, six. I'm going to cut one more. Typically, if I'm trying to do really careful work, I cut at least two extras. That way I can reject anything that's not quite right. I also make sure my workpiece is longer than it needs to be. The last thing I want to do you put on the headphones and start listening to music and I, I'm going through this, man, I'm good. And then I get my finger closer and closer and closer. You see how the cut stops right here? I bet I tip that up a little more. That's where the cut stops. I do not want my finger there. Okay. If I keep this long enough, then I never have to get my fingers that close. Because I guarantee I will forget, and one of these days I'm going to go cut myself. Okay, so I always add about four inches. Okay, and now let's check and see how we did. I normally sand these so that I don't have all that fuzz, because that will mess up my angle. Oh, just for the new folks, that if this is the first wood turning, this is a completely weird demonstration. If you want to see wood turning come next week, and we'll actually turn wood. <laughs> this one, this demonstration, I'm not going to turn. Okay, let me see if I can move my hands without moving these. Here's the trick. I bought a set of drafting triangles. I don't know how much I paid for these, but I bought some in Houston when I went to see my little brother and I cost 10 bucks for a bigger pair. Oops, I didn't. And by spending 10 bucks, I can nail that angle with no effort at all. All I have to do is be able to hold. You know, I make the jig just like I showed you, and these are gonna fit so well that I've never been able to find a problem if I manipulate my jig right. And every now and then, my mind will wander and I'll mess up, but that's how accurately you can make it with very little effort. Okay, so there's that. Now I need the white one. That's it. That's that. That's that. One of the things I have learned is take the pieces that are almost, take the scrap that looks similar to your work piece and get, get them off my table. Get them out of my way because I will forget. And the reason this works so well is because I did not move the fence. All of these have the same thickness. Oh, I'm going to real quickly knock this out. Now that I've made, I have my six cedar pieces. I need to make the Got to make the poplar pieces.
die Hände weg, Sir. Ich bin kein Mann, wie du bist. And I want, the only thing I have to do is pay attention to what I'm doing. And I can cut these as accurately as I want. And as long as that, that catch never moves, and this arm stays in good shape, these will all have the same accuracy as what you've seen before. If I do decide that I want to make a bunch of these, my hand tends to, my hand tends to get tired. I just clamp it down. And I'm off and running. could do that. I've seen people put plexiglass Flex and hand stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, normally I wear goggles. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to put them on. <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. In order to make the bottom of the bowl, I need to make this piece. cheat. You've seen how well these fit together. And now my question is, how well does that fit? I can't see light between them. So that's one test. The other test is I want to run my finger along here. And I feel just a little burr, but that's okay. I could hit that with sandpaper. After this is glued, that much sanding, that, well, I just laid the burr over, but you get the idea. This can be incredibly accurate. And the only thing I had to do was get that angle right and then be disciplined. So, making this, there's not a whole lot of, you know, crazy accuracy involved. Well, that's not true. There is some crazy accuracy involved, but all you have to do is be disciplined on how you make it and use your jig. Okay? But now I'm going to cheat because I have one of these glued together. And there's no way I can handle all of these at one time and get it done quickly. we can do is glue three of them together and if this is dark medium and light that's nothing but the tumbling block pattern that you've seen before and you can make these just one after the other real quick they all fit together so you could start with a uh, pattern of hexagons 
and do whatever pattern you want with hexagons. That's one approach. Okay. What I'm particularly interested in I glued six of these together, and I made all of these the same way uh, that I made the previous ones, but they're just a little different size, and I don't want to deal with that. So the first thing I can do is just keep radiating out from the center that same pattern. I waxed this tabletop. And it helps me feel when I'm cutting, but it drives me insane when I'm putting these together. <laughs> so, I think you can see I can carry this pattern all the way around. Now, what I'm looking for is some really cool pattern to put at the bottom of a bowl or bottom of a platter. And this pattern can be anything I want, but what I need I need to be able to turn a circle. Okay, so I need to get a little bit more room out here. And there are several ways I can do that. I can, if I continue this pattern around, the smallest diameter, smallest radius is here, and that'll give me about a quarter inch gap here. That may be all I want. If that's not enough, I can fill in here. Now that makes this a radius, and that gives me three quarters of an inch. And that, where's my bowl go? Are there are little bowls on the table. Right the tape over here. On the front end of the right. And that might be enough gap for what I'm looking for. Okay, But I can extend this out. I need at least this much to get me a good gap on this bowl. If I want a platter, I can extend this out in any way that I want. And you can see, you can go completely nuts because I can continue it this way with a different color wood. I can put this in and have these hexagon patterns all the way around. Okay. The quickest way I know to do it is to take six of these, like I just did, cut, basically I take the same stock that I used here, if I just cut one end of this at exactly the same angle, using exactly the same jig, then I can put this there, there. Oh, wow. How do you glue those together? Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and then you're cutting with the grain on that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one easy way to get me that width that I need to get that bowl coming around. Okay. Here goes the glue up. First off, I start by taping everything together. I'll tape and glue, tape and glue, and then I'll flip this over and use the same taping scheme that I showed you earlier where I put the end of the tape here, the end of the tape here, and pull, but not too tight because this one will slide back. So. Well, the first thing I do is tape it, and then I put a rubber band around it. And I have to adjust the tension on the rubber band so I'm not pulling things out of shape too far. Now, with the tape, I can pick this up and hold it up to the light. And I try to adjust things so that there's no light coming through. And I have never successfully gotten this perfect with just tape and a single rubber band. I'm going to try this and it's not going to work, I guarantee you. So, before I do it, do you have any questions about what it took to get to this point? Wow. It's, can y'all do this quick, easy? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. If you can build that jig, you're done. Type bond two. Type bond two. Yeah, that's what I I use. Type bond two because that's what I use. I got used to it. 
I trust it and I stick with it. Okay. Jim, if you cut the other end of that outside band, would it make it easier to put the rubber band on? It would. But if you notice, I have made no accurate measurements on this thing except for that 60 degree angle. And that's the reason this comes out the way it is. I could trim this and just get it close, and that might be a reasonable thing to do. It would help this rubber band. Actually, if I mark this, then I could set up my jig with a depth stop and cut all of these, and that would get this corner off. And even though it's not a perfect fit, it would help center things better. Okay, I'm going to try this. tape, this is a whole lot easier. Okay. So the first thing I do is I put a rubber band, one here, one here, one here. And then I pull them tight, I twist them over and I double it up. And it pulls all these joints together. Then I hold it up to the light and kind of wiggle it and get everything just right. And I can get, uh, do I need this? I may need this back, but I want to pass it around, and there's nothing special about that piece. In fact, I, I will need that back when I put it together, but there's nothing special about that. I made that exactly the way I made this, and I don't know if you can see any gaps at all in there. Okay. So that's how that's done. You can drive yourself nuts figuring out really cool ways of adding box to make platters, lazy susans. There's hundreds of different ways to use these six-sided pieces or these uh, 60 degrees. Okay. Are there any questions about any of this? Mm. Like building a pub. <laughs> yes. Yes. You can find quilting books that have those patterns. In yeah. Them. Quilting books are a really cool place to find a lot of different ideas. And there's a, a website, my grandfather's lathe, and he uses a different technique to build a similar kind of idea, and it has a lot of good stuff in there too. Uh, I don't have, okay. that Lazy Susan I brought in was based on an eight-sided figure. degree triangle. Somewhere. Cut eight of these and glue them up and there you have it. This one's a little different. I can't take another diamond and put it in here sideways. It doesn't work. It only works for the 60 degrees. Okay. But what you can do, that's right, let me get this out of the way. in here and it won't fit. It's because these squares have to be cut at exactly this length for all of these to fit in. So when I built that Lazy Susan, I cheated. I glued these four in, put this against the fence, and adjusted the fence until I just barely kissed the tip of the diamond. And then I did the same thing on this side on all four sides, then my triangles would fit, but they, they were oversized to stick out, and I trimmed it again. So instead of trying to get a perfect fit by accurate measurements, I just oversized everything and then trimmed it. Did the same thing here, okay? And then I put a border, a thin border around it, and put a bigger border around it, 
And that's because that's what the ladies in my family do to make this particular quilt block. Uh, in order to make the floral part, I just took a Forstner bit and cut an arc in here. I use a Forstner bit to cut out a circle. Then I glued a piece of yellow heart in there. I still had my fence where I had left it. So I could run this through. Uh, let's see. I cut my circle. I glued yellow heart in there. I turned a piece of yellow heart to fit just right. Glued that in. Put this back on the table saw. I had the fence in exactly the same position as before. Trimmed that. Took this back, cut another arc, put another piece in, ran that through the table saw, and that's how I ended up getting those petal shapes. And I did that eight times, and then I drilled a hole in the middle, put a piece of mesquite down the center, and it looked like a sunflower. So I had the lathe set up to turn two and an eighth inch diameter yellow heart circle. I had the table saw set up to cut and trim diamonds and I had a jig on the drill press set up so that I would set this up to be cut and I had a depth stop over here. This much of it was clamped to the drill press table. I pull this in and clamp it down and drill it flip it over after it already worked the other side, drill this, that's it, okay? This was just as easy as this to make. Well, almost as easy. I had the complication that I had to trim. Do you have any questions about the eight-sided stuff? It's pretty, easy. pretty impressive. And you look at quilt blocks, and you go nuts for these things. Just so I can wrap up this kind of jig. This is a 72 degree angle. So I do so many stars, the five point stars that I made these plastic triangles so that I can set this up at 72 degrees very accurately. How did you cut those, Jim? Uh, the plexiglass. Okay. I have a, a sled with a swinging arm, and I have 10 pieces of plywood approximately this size, and I cut those 10, put them in a circle, measure the gap, adjust my arm, cut them again, and I continue doing that until I have no gap. Hmm. Then I lock that position and I cut these. Okay. First I cut this 90, I used a technique to cut this 90 degrees very accurately. Then I set up my table saw to cut an accurate 36 and cut all of these, all the ones that are in the room right now, I cut these all at once. And then I put five of them against my fence to make sure they came out just right. And that's how, I, that's how I did that. You just cut them on the table saw with a wood blade? Or? Yes, yeah. Okay. yeah. Same blade, same style of blade that I'm using here. And again, go real, real slow, but not so slow you burn. Yeah. Question, Jennifer. Were the three angles on that are what, 90, 36, and 60? 54. Well, 54. Yes, right. yeah. The trick to these is get the 90 right. There's a technique for that. Then I work my tail off to get 36 degrees right. This one has to be 54. That's right. It's got to be. It has okay. to be. And you can't buy that because a standard in a near triangle is a 30, 60, 90. Right. Uh -huh. you, you can go, I'm sure there's places by tech that sell drafting triangles. Yes. Varsity Bookstore. Varsity? Okay. Which we get a 20% discount there. 
Okay. By virtue of being a member of this club. This one I made, but it turns out you can buy an accurate 36 degrees from Seg Easy. It's not a triangle, it's a wedge. Mm. But they sell a 36 degree wedge. Okay, so if you don't want to make your own, or if you didn't get, actually if you have one of these or somebody you know has one of them, I'm hoping that I can show you how to make these. If you have, if you have one, you can make one. I'll try to get to that point to talk. Uh, real quickly, if I set this angle at 72 degrees and cut diamonds, that's what we end up with. Okay. And when you put them together, this is the typical scar that you get. And it's, it's typically not what we're looking for. But if you have a bunch of grandkids and a, you need to make a whole bunch of gifts, you can put your picture on this, and there you have it. Put a hole in here and hang it off the Christmas tree, and you got it made. Okay. Uh, there's more I can talk about this, but I want to save that for later, so I'll make sure I, I, I finish this. Okay. Okay, I'm going to get rid of... Let's see. That's okay. This is the base, and the accuracy, the difficult part of making this was by spending about ten bucks on two of these, and that gave us this angle accurately. And by being precise, we could make this very well. Now I need to cut segments in the other end of the triangle. Or show me that. Okay. Basically, all the accuracy involved in this bowl you buy. Okay. One of the hardest parts I've had to deal with on this, I've got so much junk that I have to move around. Okay, give me that. Give me that. And I'll leave these jigs laying around afterwards, so if you want to take a look at it, you can. If you look at what's brought in to the show and tell, You'll see a lot of stuff with segments around it, a lot of rings stacked up. And I would not try segmented work because I didn't have the tools, I didn't have the skills, and I didn't have the confidence to do all that stuff. I just wasn't good enough. And it turns out, it's, it's like a lot of things, it's, it, the doubt resides in my head, not in reality. In order to cut those 12 segments and to do so accurately, I'm going to use a drafting triangle, and I'm going to steal a design from SEG Easy. It's S-E-G-E-A-S-Y. You can learn more about this kind of work from their website than I can tell you in several hours of stuff. The punchline is I want to start with a jig that has a runner that slides fairly accurately inside my table saw. I keep mine a little bit loose and I just press the jig this way. That way I'm always riding against this edge. Okay. And it works for me. Some people get that really tight and it runs true. I've never bought a table saw where I could do that. It always hangs up. Okay. This half of the sled is the basic idea. And everything that I've turned recently, Everything that I've turned up until pretty recently is built on a jig pretty much like this. It's this part of the sled. Get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of all this, and that's what I used. And you build it by putting your runner in, gluing it, and then probably best to screw it from underneath so that the runner and the base ride true. Glue this arm down, put your triangle in there with a 30 degree point and use that to set this fence. You can buy that 30 degree wedge from SAG Easy, and they have a whole list of them that you can buy. So 
this is for 12 segments per ring. The 36 degree that I made is for 10 segments, but you can buy, you know, eight, I think they go to 48, something like that. And they want $13 for the wedge, which if, if you're doing something other than 30 degrees, it's probably money well spent. But that, that's all the accuracy you need. Okay, it's just like that other jig. I'm going to buy the accuracy and go at it this way. Okay. So here's my wood for the lower triangle. Or the, there's the base. Here's the lower triangle. And here's the upper, I'm sorry, the, the lower ring and here's the upper ring. I'm going to use this upper ring and I'm just going to make this one and I'll show you. It's pretty straightforward. I've prepared my wood so that it's straight and parallel and I had the width. I've calculated what width I want and I don't calculate that accurate, accurately. I kind of guess and then I make it wider than it needs to be. And that way I don't have to worry about a lot of stuff. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I know how to fix that. Okay, my board's too long. I'm gonna hit the headstock. I'm gonna whack it in half. And I can get away with that because I'm pretty sure this board is too long. And if it's not, I don't know what I'm going to do, but we'll figure something out. What I would do, set the board here, make a cut, and then I would just start moving it back and forth. Okay, but my board's too long, so I had to cut it. So now I'm going to trim it. Basically a depth stop.
is kind of like th that other work. Once I've set up the jig to function accurately, now it's just a question of discipline. I need to keep all these surfaces clean. I need to touch slowly. in a hurry and getting sloppy. That's a bad idea. show you how accurately they can be, but I can do that with six. And I'm getting in a hurry, and that is not acceptable. So, let me see if I have room to get six of these on there. Now this is supposed to be a 12 segment ring. So six of them ought to form a half segment. bunch of fuzz on these that I should have sanded off. Okay, there's some gaps here. But I can, that's because of the fuzz. If I pull these together and clean that fuzz off, those gaps disappear. The trick to getting this right is to set up your jig right, and that's done by buying a drafting triangle, and then carefully cut each segment and clean the fuzz off each time you cut. And there's no light that comes through there. I can't see any light. This half of the jig is what you need. I have a tendency to want to reach up and grab these while they come off the blade. Not acceptable. So I added this other with the clamps. And when I'm at home, I go, I get a pace where I can set this in place, set my distance clamp it down, get my hand back over here, or use a spring clamp, and I just get a rhythm. And I can cut all of these I want to all day long, and I go slow and carefully. Not, I do not go as fast as I did today. I go slow. Jim, couldn't you, instead of having the two boards there, just have uh -huh. one board and you make a cut and you just flip your board over and you set the length and then run it through again? You can do that. But you have to set that one board exactly the correct angle. So, which way to go? I had no idea that stuck up so high. <laughs> Several things have to happen on a jig like this. First off, I have to set this at exactly 75. 
Okay, I don't want to use the word exactly. I have to set this so close to 75 that the human eye can't see the difference when I cut 12 of these. Here's 75 degrees. Okay, and then when I flip it over and set my distance, this face has to be parallel to this face, and all of that's doable. And, and you can build a jig like this, and you don't need the numbers. All you need to do is find 75 degrees, and you can do that. Okay. The reason this Seg Easy jig is so popular is because I set that very accurately, and I'm done. And if these are angled a little bit, it doesn't matter. I still get 12 very, very well-made rings. That's the reason this is so easy. Anybody can do it. If you can set these two fences, you're done. Okay. How many of you guys use the sag easy kind of deal? How many guys use something else or gals? <coughs> I really like this. Now I have to make a different jig for every dimension, and that's a bit of a nuisance, but and that's the reason I made that 36 degree triangle. This one does one job very, very well, and it's very easy to do. And you can buy from Seg Easy all these different uh, uh, different angles for different numbers of segments for 13 bucks. I think is the last I saw. And if you buy their base, it's adjustable. Mm -hmm. Yes, they have one that has, let me turn this, There's a. this arm is adjustable, the angle, with a pin here and a knob here to tighten it down and you can, one jig can do all this stuff, okay? One of these days I'm going to make one, but... There's a YouTube video showing how to make the double adjustable. Uh -huh. well. Yes, awesome. this is, there's a lot of information on the Seg Easy site, there's a ton of information on YouTube about this jig, okay? So, let me think. Seven minutes. <laughs> There's one jig. Okay. This is what I was afraid of. I'm going to get to a point where there's a lot of stuff. Okay, let me stop. In order to make that bowl, we needed to make the base, and we've done that. And we needed to make the two rings, and we've done that. Then we need to cut the banding up into short segments. Stick them between the rings. Okay. Then we have to glue all this together. These we can just glue up with a rubber band. You can put multiple rubber bands around there. Or you can drill a hole all the, all the way through a piece of wood, run parachute cord through there. So you buy 50 feet of parachute cord, tie a knot in it, put a stick in there. Crank it up just a little, just a little. And then you go through and check every joint. Make sure it's lined up. Get it flat. Clean it off so you can see because there's glue oozing up out of here. And then crank it a little bit more. And then the thing that I've learned about these stars is that, okay, let me back up. The rings don't tend to move that much. They slide around. They'll slide a little bit while you have it lightly clamped, but once you clamp it tight, they don't seem to move much. But the disc, these guys will shift. So I've learned I clamp it lightly and I adjust everything. I clamp it intermediate pressure and I adjust everything and then I wait 
and I come back and I look at it five minutes later. Loosen the clamps if I have to, put everything back in place, and then clamp it. And that's the one thing I've learned about getting these right, is that, you know, I figured out to 36 degrees I can get that. It takes time, but I can get it. And then I'd mess them up, glue them up, and it's because things would shift after I put that intermediate clamping pressure. Okay. If I can have about just a couple more minutes, uh, there, 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 there. This thing is a hexagon. I've measured it, and these three distances are the same to within a thousandth of an inch. If I now bevel the blade or tilt the blade over and cut these at the right angle, I can make a soccer ball. Oh, I've seen that. An easy way to do that is to make one of them super, super accurately. This is called a pattern maker's fence. I clamp it on here. I have my template. I put sandpaper down here so that they kind of grip. Adjust my fence. And there you have it. It's the equivalent of this, but I don't have to set any depth stops or anything like that. I just have to have my template firmly attached here, and I just use sandpaper and downward pressure. So if you make one of these, you can make a bunch of them identically. So making a soccer ball is not that bad a deal. Use the 36 triangle to set this at 72 degrees, so you need to make two. Then you can make the pentagon. Make the pentagon with uh, the same length here. That's the only criteria. And bevel it at the appropriate angle, and there's a soccer ball. Okay. I'm going to show you this, and then I'll shut up. The reason I didn't demonstrate the five-point star is because it's quite a bit harder than these others. First off, you have to get that 36-degree angle right, and that's trial and error, or I hope those triangles help. The other thing is making a ring is easy, but making the disc where everything comes to a clean point and all these points, that's difficult. Okay, and I'll show you how I'll do it. I start with a board, that's the border, and I cut it up at 54 degrees, and I do it, I set my, my that swinging arm jig at 54 degrees, and it's not 54.0 degrees, it's 54, I set it, forget it, it doesn't have to be that accurate. Cut this thing up like cookies. you how we make and I glue it on and I take a piece of a darker contrasting material and I glue it on. Each piece has been cut at 54 degrees so I use the same table saw setting and I glue everything up so it fits along this line. This is how I used to do it. Here's 54, 54, 72 degrees. So this is the side opposite 72. I just put everything in there and clamp it. And the only difference here is that I've cut this piece in half so that I can use this half on one side, this half on another piece. This technique is very efficient for material, but it's a lot of effort. I have to do this 10 times. And then I have to trim this edge true. And I'll do it with this jig. 
I have a depth stop over here that gives me about 20 thousandths of an inch. And I'll run this through. And if it's not enough, I'll take another 20 thousandths and run it through. And I do every piece the same way. If I run this through once, I run them through once. If I run any of them twice, I run them all twice. Till I have that edge straight. Okay? That gets me to this point, and then I have to cut that off at 36 degrees. This is the only critical cut of the whole thing. This angle has to be right. Okay. I can make this board a little wider, a little narrower, and all it does is change the size of the border. I can make these bands a little thicker, a little narrower, and all it does is change that. It's not important to me. I can make these pieces a little bigger, a little smaller, and all it does is change the size of this. I'm not, I don't worry about that. The critical aspect is I have to get this side cut the same on all of them. So I need a good, accurate glue up to start with, and I need to trim it on all the same. So it's a question of discipline more than accuracy. Then when I make that final cut, That has to be 36 degrees, and I have to cut all of them exactly the same, or they won't fit. So it's a question of discipline. One precise angular cut. The rest of it is about precision. Do the same thing over and over again. And then again, be careful on the glue up, because things will shift. And I'll, I'll tell you the one thing that I've learned in order to get that to come to a perfect point, you have to have these really, really sharp and all that. I take just a tiny bit off the tip. So there, if you look close enough, there is a hole there. But that keeps me from having that little burr at the end, and that's what holds me off a lot of times and messes up that circle. Okay, that's the hard way. Very efficient as far as material, but quite difficult in terms of labor. I put that back on there, put that back on there. What if I take my center board, which is my border, and I take a long banding and I glue it over here, and I glue it over here all the way across, and then I take my star material, and I put a dark one on this side and a light one on this side. Cut everything just exactly as I've done. It eliminates this cleanup step because all of this is cut in one shot. And then I take these big pieces and I have to make that 36 degree cut. This is very efficient as far as the uh, time. Because I cut a bunch of boards, I cut a bunch of bandings, I cut the outside pieces, they're all straight and parallel, but which is a table saw does that beautifully. I glue it all at one time, then I make the 54 degree cut. By the way, the 54 degree cut is what makes this line straight. doesn't have to be that accurate because your eye will force it to look straight. And this is a really easy way to do it. It's inefficient as far as material. I have a bunch of material left over, but it turns out you can make another kind of star out of that. Starlight. Okay, star I'll shut up now. <laughs> All right, well thank you Jim.